This is Counterculture with Marie Busky. Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on Reality Check Radio. You're with Reality Check Radio and I am Marie, your host for Counterculture. And this morning, my guest really doesn't need much introduction. You hear him on the political panel on Fridays. It is Cam Slater. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Marie? I'm very good, thank you. I wanted to talk to you this morning about firearms because it is something that got brought up in the interview I did with Naomi Wolf. And I think it's one of those elements of New Zealand life that doesn't get talked about. And I think we do need to talk about it. Gun ownership in New Zealand. Give us a rundown of perception versus reality. Okay, there's a perception that we've got really, really strict gun laws in New Zealand. And to a certain extent, that's true, but it's also not true. Um, Up until uh, the Christchurch uh, massacre, we had a licensing regime that focused on uh, allowing people to have firearms if they met a fit and proper person test. Now, I say that it's a test, but it's it's not actually a test. This is the the whole thing about firearms law in New Zealand. It's also, it's it's almost like it's asked backwards. So they say that you can only um, get a firearms license if you are a fit and proper person. And if you look at the Arms Act 1983 and all of the amendments that have been done to that since, there's no test on what a fit and proper person is. There's only a list of what a fit and proper person isn't. And so, so exactly. So if you go through the Arms Act and have a look at it, it says you you can't be a fit and proper person if these things are true, if even one of these things is true. And they're a a little bit amorphous as well. Like one of them is is if you don't follow regulations. Now, this is fraught with danger because regulations, though technically a law, they're actually not in the law. They've been passed by an order in council by cabinet and haven't yet had parliament agree to them being a law and put into the Arms Act. And the chances of you finding what those regulations are as a layperson are very slim. And there's all sorts of regulations that that have been passed, uh, especially recently. Now, we had Stuart Nash as the the, um, police minister, and he was uh, in the 2017 election uh, saying that he wanted to end this uh, arms regulation via the order in councils and to put it through the parliament, which is what should happen. But then he um, absolutely just went with gay abandon, passing regulations that the police would come with to him with, and he never questioned them. He just took them straight to cabinet and had them approved. And a good example of this is the rule the, the regu- I call them rules, the rules and regulations around transportation of firearms have been changed substantially. So if you were going hunting, you'd have your gun in a gun bag or a case, you'd chuck it in the back of the ute with all your gear, you'd drive off um, to where you're going hunting, park your car, get out, go hunting, come back. Well, now you have to have that firearm secured within the vehicle and the, the suggestions from the police are that it, you have a chain somehow securing it to the chassis of the car. And it's nonsensical because if you've got, say, four people going hunting, and I often do go hunting with four or more people, we may have um, some 22s for shooting possums, some shotguns uh, for um, you know, a little bit of pest control on some hares or rabbits that jump out from underneath you. And then we may have our hunting rifles for shooting deer. And we could end up with four people having something like 20 guns on board the, the ute. Well, you can't chain all of those to the chassis. You can't lock all of those up. So but what these are, are the regulations. So what is passed. the purpose? So whoever suggested this, what is the purpose of that? Is it because they're wanting, if the vehicle was breached in a say a robbery that those guns would not be able to remo- remove is that what the goal of well, the well, regulation well, that's, is that's the thought process but you can see that a feeble-minded person has come up with this thought process 
What we've got is this new firearms authority, which is essentially a, a business unit of the police. And, and it's key to know that, it, that it's a business unit. It has a profit uh, incentive. And that's why they're looking at ratcheting up the fees and everything. But they've got this bunch of wombles down there who really don't know how ordinary people use firearms. Coming up with cockamamie scenarios of alleged crimes with no evidence that such a crime has even happened or if it has happened uh, has caused considerable harm and passing regulations using order and counsel to regulate this new event that may or may not happen. Now, what the police have been doing in some districts is is unconscionable. What they've been doing is waiting a kilometre down the road from a gun club and then stopping every vehicle that was at the gun club as they're leaving and then saying to them, we'd like to inspect how you stored your firearms in the vehicle. And most people don't understand the law. And the law says that the police can't, that's not a, a proper reason for them to inspect inside your vehicle. And the regulation allows them to do this Sort of, except the regulation doesn't trump the law, and the law says that they have to give you seven days' notice of a time that's suitable to you as the firearms owner, not the police. So if they pull you up on the side of the road and say, can we have a look at your firearms in the car, you're perfectly entitled under the law to say no. And there's nothing they can do about it. And so you've got these regulations that are in uh, are operating in contravention of the law and the police are, are essentially bullying people or relying on people's goodwill um, to comply with the regulation in the first place. And another example of that is uh, for collectors, for example, like myself, we can buy and sell pistols and machine guns and submachine guns and hand grenades and artillery pieces and all of that sort of stuff. And it's all permitted and it's all... Uh, you know, in order to buy um, such a thing, we have to go and this is the ludicrous thing. There's so much paperwork. You have to fill in an application for a permit to possess that weapon, right? So you've got to apply for the permit to possess. You fill out what it is you're buying, who you're buying it from, what their firearms license number is, all of those sorts of details, and you fill in yours. You then send that to the arms officer who then farts around. Now, I'm lucky I get them done within 24 hours because they're scared of me. But but what happens is you get mucked around and then eventually they say, oh, it's okay, you can come and pick up your permit to possess, right? So you then go to the police station to pick up the permit to possess and it's got exactly the same details on it for you as you put in your application. All they've done is handwrite what you put into the application form, transferred it into the permit to possess, but left the bottom part, the, the who you're buying it from, the seller's details, completely blank, even though you've already provided it to them in the application. You then take that, uh, that permit to possess to uplift the firearm, fill in all of their details, and then you've got to take the firearm and the permit to possess back to the police so that they can inspect that what you've bought is, in fact, what your permit is allowed. Then they take a copy, you take a copy, and you leave with the firearm. But it's different if you, say, buy something at a gun auction or at a gun show. There's usually police officers there who, who won't even do the application for a permit to possess. They'll just uh, provide a permit to possess right there and then on the spot. Now, I had an inspection at my house and the police accused me of disposing of a firearm illegally. And I'd sold that at a gun show and a police officer was there who'd given the permit to possess to the new person and taken it off my licence, except they never processed the paperwork from that. And so it was still on my licence and technically I was in breach of the law because I couldn't um, present the firearm to them that I still owned it, even though I'd sold it. And then, uh, after they accused me of all of that, and I said, well, why don't you ask what actually happened? 
And uh, instead of accusing me from the get-go, and that's the problem, is, is the police just a- a- accuse you. They treat all gun owners as potential criminals rather than uh, remembering that they had to approve us as a fit and proper person, bearing in mind that list of things that you you can't do. And, if you, and one of those is break the law. So we are law-abiding people because if we weren't, we would be a fit and proper person. But the whole premise of their attack on us is that we're criminals. And so we need to have these regulations to do this. So this arms officer says to me, well, do you have a copy of the paperwork to prove that? And I said to him, yes, I do. And he said, well, well, can I have a copy? And I said, no. He said, well, why not? I said, because I'm not required under the law to give you that piece of paper. I could voluntarily give it to help you out, but I don't see why I should help you out because you've just accused me of committing a crime. And so, therefore, it's not in my interest to help you out. It's in my interest to protect the information that will give me a good, solid defence. And if you knew the law and you're a police officer, you wouldn't have done that. So, no, I'm not going to give you the paperwork. And this is the thing. If you know the law, then you're, you're in a much better position than just accepting what the police say. And we've seen during the pandemic that police are willing to break the law. Ends justifies the means for them. So anybody out there who thinks that the police are on firearms owners' side is deluded. They are against you. They are the enemy. They're not there to help you. They're there to hinder you. And all these regulations that are being passed are being dreamed up by people who know nothing about how people actually use firearms. And they're creating a legal morass for themselves and for shooters that's not based on any law. And this is the real problem that we have, you know, and and there's there's no constitutional right to bear arms in New Zealand, right? So... um, No Second Amendment here. No Second Amendment here. But if you are a fit and proper person, you, you can possess firearms. And under New Zealand law... You, if you've got a firearm, you have to have a lawful, proper and sufficient purpose, right? Those are the legal terms needed to use, discharge or carry the firearm, right? And self-defence is not One of a lawful, proper purpose and sufficient, uh, yeah, sufficient purpose. Right? Self-defence is not one of those. Um, what, it's an what, are, what are some of those? Uh, well, if you're if you're doing pest control, if you're going hunting, if you're going to the pistol club, if you're going to uh, target practice, those are lawful purposes for you to carry a firearm. That is, it's on your person and under your control, right? It, it doesn't mean transport. Transport's different, and that's why where the police get in trouble when they're stopping you, and the and the firearms in your car, you're not carrying it. It's not on your person. And so they have no legal basis to stop you to inspect how you stored something in your car. That then comes under a premise or a house or a vehicle, and they have to give you seven days' notice. So you can't possess a firearm in anticipation that you might even need to use it in self-defence, right? So so that if you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to get a firearms licence because I need to defend my family, you won't get it, right? You have to have a lawful purpose to get that firearm. But the Crimes Act, the Crimes Act is slightly different and it says that you're allowed to use reasonable force to defend yourself, right, against assault or entry into a dwelling house, but it needs to be proportionate to any force that's being used against you, right? So you have to make an assessment that the person trying to break into your house is going to give you, do you harm, uh, is carrying a firearm, is prepared to use that firearm before you can even make the decision to go and get your firearm out of the safe and then use it to defend yourself. And even then, the police will probably charge you, put you through the hoops and cost you $90,000 to defend it. Yeah. But some people have successfully defended themselves in that way, and, and Greg Carvel at um, SAI Guns is one of those people. But he was put through the ringer by the mm. police. You know, There was a guy who came into his shop armed with a a machete or a large knife who was trying to harm the staff and Greg shot him. And but the police still charged him. But he got he got off. Right. Well a few questions that I have 
is firstly, how many people in the last 12 months died in a firearms-related incident, do you know? I don't know the number, but it's a small number. Hmm. Like, you know, we're, we're passing, passing regulations for much less deaths than there are people dying on the roads. Which is, so that was the, the bow that I was going to draw because, well, what, 300 odd people die on our roads every year in a motor vehicle accident of one form or another. The regulation in terms of exchanging ownership of a motor vehicle or a, of any sort is a fairly straightforward affair without all of the hoo-ha, and yet gun ownership is applied with this level of convoluted complexity that benefits no one. Yeah, it used to be easy. It was straightforward. And then Christchurch happened, and then the police used that for an ideological reason to clamp down on gun owners because the police have imported a lot of English police into the police force. And in Great Britain, the gun laws are very restrictive. And they don't see a reason why we shouldn't do the same thing here, forgetting our upbringing, you know, that, you know, we were a frontier nation, really. You know, there was a need to hunt. There was a need to provide food. There's a need to do all of these sorts of things. And um, that's all been strictly controlled, you know, by the aristocracy in the UK for thousands of years. Right? Mm. <laughs> so, but we, we had to provide for ourselves and defend ourselves. And, you know, we've had essentially civil wars uh, occur in the 1800s, uh, the land wars, et cetera. And firearms ownership was quite lax in up until about the 70s. You know, I, I, when I first started work, I started working in the National Bank and I worked with a guy who was like 400 million years old and um, he was telling me about how they used to go and collect the money from the Reserve Bank on a flatbed truck with big chests uh, and they were issued revolvers. And they would sit on the back of this truck on the chests with revolvers in their hands to go, and some banks actually had a, a revolvers in, in the bank. You know, in, in, in my younger days, you know, there used to be a gun shop on Queen Street called Tisdall's. And you used to go, it was a good gun shop, and had a good gunsmith there. And you used to walk down the street with a gun over your shoulder, down Queen Street with a gun over your shoulder to take it into the gun shop to have some work done on it. No one butted an eyelid. If you try and do that now, you'll have 57 police uh, in sort of SWAT gear trying to shoot you um, because you're carrying a firearm in public, even though you're actually allowed to do that. Yeah, look, I'm from a rural community and it was just normal. I mean, on the back of the ute, I mean, everyone had a sort of a cradle in the back of the truck yeah. where the shotgun sat uh, and that's... So you're not allowed to do that now. You're not no. allowed to have them in a cradle on the back of the ute. You're not allowed to have them um, visible. They have to be locked and secured and all that now. Yeah, you know, I know farmers who drive around in the ute or their motorbike, they've got a 22 handy, mm. they see a rabbit, it's dead, right? They just shoot it right there and then. And now if it's locked up and it's and they have to stop and get it, well, the rabbit's gone. <laughs> it's just nuts what these people, the, the police are dreaming up. So, you know, the legislation in 1983, which I actually helped write, um, was quite good. It was focused around mental health. It was focused around licensing the person, not the firearm. The police had actually re recommended that a re uh, firearms register be abandoned except for restricted and prohibited firearms, and, and that's pistols and collectors' items and things like that. So we kind of have a gun register now, but as I explained earlier, it's got holes in it. You know, mm -hmm. Things that are on my licence that I don't have anymore, that I legally sold and did with the proper paperwork, but the police lost the paperwork, but I'm the person who's at fault. So, so the, the, the rec recommendation was to carry on with that and tighten it up around certain aspects, but they've gone completely overboard now and spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to bring in a gun register on the premise, the false premise, that having a register is going to prevent criminals getting guns. Well, you know, I don't know what world they live in, but criminals don't follow the law, so they won't care that there's a gun register because they don't follow the law, they're criminals. So it's not going to stop criminals getting guns. So let's cycle back to the buyback. 
So, I mean, all of this, Christchurch was the catalyst of all of this. Well, it wasn't a buyback because the government never had the guns to give to you that they could buy back, right? It was a confiscation with compensation. And they had to do a a confiscation with compensation because the Arms Act actually said if you're going to confiscate somebody's firearms, you have to pay fair market value for it. So unless they changed the law rapidly, they couldn't have done that. They had to pay money for it, you know. So, So, sorry. No, so because from my perspective, as someone who isn't a gun owner now, I mean, my father, I mean, as a farmer, he was that, and yeah. I, we grew up with it. I learned, I mean, I learned how to shoot a 22, literally shooting rabbits on the farm. So I, for me, it was part of everyday life. I look at that now, or is all of this the cost that we're paying, that gun owners are paying for the virtue signaling? from our former Prime Minister to look good? It's worse than that. Yes, there's the virtue signalling, the, you know, um, hug an immigrant type, you know, behaviour that she exhibited, which was appalling it in in the worst aspects. But the biggest gun grabbers ever in the world, in the history of the world, are communists and socialists. Right? They're the biggest gun grabbers because the last thing that they need uh, is to have people with firearms who can rise up and say, you know, we don't like what you're doing. Uh, and so they confiscate guns and take them away. Totalitarians, whether they're fascists, they're fascist socialists anyway. You know, they're, they're, they're the corporate version of socialism. But they want the general public disarmed, vulnerable, and then the apparatus of the state can grind you down. Uh, with their application of force. So at the same time that the police were passing all these new regulations and rules and changing the Arms Act and doing all this in the, in the wake of uh, Christchurch, at the same time as they were doing that, they were buying up an armoury of, of advanced weaponry uh, that includes uh, a replacements for their um, 223 or 5.56 millimetre uh, assault rifles which they banned everybody else from having, but they've got them. Uh, they then upgraded a, a, a large number of those with 7.62 millimetre or 308, which is a much bigger calibre, makes leaves much bigger holes. Uh, they've got a whole lot of those and they haven't told anybody that they've got those. They, they let me know by mistake when I answered a Official Information Act request when I asked about magazines. Because the rifles that they bought all came with 20-round magazines. And I noticed in the wake of um, Christchurch, the police were all on the streets, but they had 30 and 40-round magazines. And I wondered where they got those from and why. And then asking the question about the magazines, they admitted to owning all of these other firearms with much bigger firepower. And then, of course, we saw in, in Wellington the use of baton rounds, grenade launchers, um, you know, at, These are military weapons that the police have obtained, kept it on the down low. It's only when there's something like that that we saw them come out. So when you say the police have obtained, are we saying that they have been obtained, they've gone out and purchased those? Yes. Or Because where did all the guns that they confiscated go? Well, that's a good question because I happen to know of some guns that were confiscated, paid out to the owner and then were suddenly on the license of somebody else and uh, there was supposedly a lot of them destroyed but the what I'm talking about the police have got are new they've bought those in uh, including the Hitler so and that Cop, didn't appear in the um, budget then, did it? no so they've bought grenade launchers that fire 40 millimeter grenades and a variety of ra- rounds that are available for those now we've seen them use the baton rounds which is essentially a, a, a hard plastic, which will knock you over and leave you, leave you with a bad bruise. And if it gets you in the face, it could cause permanent damage to your eyes or, or whatever, knock your teeth out, whatever. But the police have these weapons. These are military-grade weapons. Their assault rifles are military-grade weapons. But at the same time, they've been disarming people from having similar firepower. So you you... You kind of look at it from a philosophical point of view or, or a political agenda point of view. The police are arming up while they're disarming citizens. That would 
normally cause a little bit of consternation. Why, you know, it used to be the police armed defenders squad were the only ones that were armed, and then they had Sarko treble two rifles. Well, now they've got military weapons. They've got, uh, you know, they have Americanized the police. They've got ballistic armor. They've got ballistic helmets. They've got um, vehicles with bulletproof uh, doors and windows. So they're they're militarizing the police and raising their capability at the same time as taking guns off people. And that's a concern at the moment. But the more the government pursues a divisive agenda where they're separating society into groups, you know, we saw this with vaccinated, non-vaccinated. Now we're seeing it with Maori and non-Maori co-governance, which where 15% of the population get 50% of the say. These things create division in society and increase, especially when you apply racial divisions, increase the, the likelihood of seeing civil unrest and potentially civil war. Now, you mentioned the Second Amendment in the United States. And you have to understand that the Second Amendment uh, supports the First Amendment, right? So the right to free speech is the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And the Second Amendment, in order to protect the First Amendment, is that free persons have the right to bear arms, form militia, and protect themselves from the excesses of the government. Now, the U.S. Constitution was written by a group of people immediately after the Revolutionary War where they seceded from the United Kingdom and fought a war against the best army in the world. Right? This is the army uh, that then went on to defeat Napoleon. Right, So it's only a few years before that that the British army was getting beaten by a bunch of hunters and trappers and you know, civilians that had armed themselves uh, to protect themselves from the excesses of, in this case, a royalist army. And it's um, it comes out of having that war, a civil war, a revolutionary war. It comes out from being oppressed. And we haven't had that in New Zealand. We haven't had a full-on civil war. We haven't had a revolutionary war. You know, the, the Treaty of Waitangi, a lot of people criticise it, but it actually stopped civil war. And... We haven't got that background that would lead us to having smart and well-read people coming up with a written constitution that protects free speech and supports that protection of free speech by allowing people to have firearms. And so we're not in the same boat constitutionally as the United States, but we're getting close to having that civil unrest happening, and we're already seeing the start of that with increasingly violent crime and where people are rebelling against society. But uh, also, too, us. with the increasingly violent crime, the police almost seem, appear to be bystanders in this. So they've armed themselves up to the teeth, and yet they don't appear to be doing anything in order to prevent it or stop it. No, but as society breaks down and crime becomes more rampant, and people then make the next step, and they start to defend themselves, and they'll start with using baseball bats and, um, you know, iron bars and things like that. And when that doesn't work, then they'll step it up. And it's only a matter of time before some little ram-raiding scumbag in a car gets shot um, by a, a guy who's had his 15th robbery and has had enough and has gone, gone and got himself yeah. a The hockey a stick's shot. no longer doing the trick, so yeah, let's go yeah, with something that, a bit stronger. That, mm. That's right. And then they just blow them away. And, and then you're going to see it all clamped down on the victims of the crime, not the perpetrators of the crime, which goes, I mean, just go back even to the Christchurch situation. We've had all of these laws come in to stop what was an aberration and an aberration that was allowed for through mistakes by the police and including changes to the legislation that allowed people like Tarrant to buy ammunition and firearms willy-nilly online, and Jacinda Ardern herself was the one who pushed that law change through. So what we've got is an ass-covering situation with these laws to protect something happening again, which will happen again. There's nothing you can do to stop it. 
Uh, if people want to go and kill lots of people, they'll find a way to do it, whether it's a truck or a baseball bat in a in a uh, movie theater um, or, or a bomb or, or a firearm. They'll do it. They'll drive a car through a crowd. If they want to kill lots of people because they're crazy, you can't stop crazy. There's no law that you can do use to stop crazy. And so what they've done is victimise 250,000 innocent gun owners who, bear, bear in mind, were fit, are fit and proper people. Right? Yeah. We, are, we have to be law-abiding because if we're not law-abiding, we're not a fit and proper person. The police gave Tarrant a firearms licence on the basis of people that he met online being referees after being in the country for next to no time. And... They made the mistakes. They made the mistakes in the vetting. They made the mistakes in giving him the license. They made the mistakes in, in having a system that allowed him to buy large amounts of ammunition. They made all those mistakes, and it's us as firearm owners who are paying the penalty for that, not the police. In terms of having an effective opposition when any of these sorts of things <laughs> happen, I know it's an oxymoron, why then is it that so often when these convoluted pieces of legislation come down and you do have a change of government that those who are coming in don't do anything about it they just leave it in place is it because it is too much effort why it's called political inertia it's easier to do nothing than to do something and unless there's a political will to do this, and the political will usually manifests itself after a tragedy, and then you get aberrations with law and stupid law and you know rushed law. Um, yeah, you know, in 1983, that was uh, when the Arms Act was written. There was no um, cause for that to be written. It was. They realised that the existing Arms Act was out of date. They needed to modernise it. They needed to simplify it. And they actually wrote a really good piece of legislation. And Peter Hilt was um, involved in a lot of that. He's now passed. Uh, then we had the Aramwana massacre, which then led to the creation of additional regulations and rules around what they called military-style semi-automatic uh, firearms. But it was bizarre. You know, they said if it's got a bayonet lug on the barrel and can carry a bayonet, then it qualifies as a military-style semi-automatic. You know, what is a bayonet lug going to do that a bullet's going to do less? You know, if, you know, it's just ludicrous. If it had a pistol grip. You know, now, most hunting rifles these days come out with some sort of chassis and you know, the target rifles have got pistol grips and, that, and all of that. And so you, all of a sudden you've got these laws applying to, to stupid things. Um, so what usually happens is there's a massive event and then something happens and they change the law and then you get bad law and then it just compounds. Or they're trying to mend the act in such a way that renders it unfit for purpose. And that's what we've got now. We've got so many regulations, so many amendments, that the Arms Act is not fit for purpose anymore. And it requires a political party or parties who have got significant strength to actually say, no, we need to rewrite this law. We need to start from the ground up. And we need to get people who understand firearms to write the law, who understand how people use firearms and how they use them, how they collect them, how they do these, how they store them, how they transport them, and write the law so that it's it's sensible, not being run by a committee that's controlled by the police, whose default uh, premise is that firearms owners are potential criminals, and we need to cut down every avenue we can dream up to to have one. And, and going back to that transport thing, right? I actually asked the police how many guns have been stolen from vehicles that would not have been stolen if they'd been secured in accordance with the new law. And they came back with a number, and then I said to them, okay, now exclude the police from that, and the number was zero. Right? So all of the guns that have been stolen from cars in the last 10 years and then subsequently used in crimes have been police weapons stolen from police cars. 
<laughs> so they've passed the law to inconvenience the shotgun shooter who belongs to the local shotgun club on the basis that there's actually no crime that's ever been committed in amongst the general population. And then you asked about shootings. You know, it's a small number, but there's a significant amount of that small number are people who have been shot by the police. So if you exclude that, the number's even smaller. You're with Counterculture. I am Marie. I'm talking to Cam Slater, and we're discussing the state of firearms and firearms legislation here in New Zealand. I'm going to pivot slightly. Yeah. Last week, uh, the Radio New Zealand did a piece around police staying tight-lipped in regards to their preparation towards the election. I thought this was an exceptionally bizarre story. What on earth are they expecting to happen? This is the problem with the police, with the disinformation project, with politicians in general, right? If you are always looking for monsters, everything you find is a monster because it's what you're looking for. You know, if you've got a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. And this is what the police do. Is they, they've, they've, you've got the disinformation project that's talking about political discourse that's hurty words and mean things and stuff like that, and that this is, you know, polarising people. And they don't look at why people are being polarised, right? They don't look at, at how people are reacting, why they're reacting like that. It's the politicians that cause the polarisation, but it's our fault when we react against it. And so they create these these scenarios and then the police buy into that and and start talking about, oh, the risks to politicians. And Well, it's bollocks. It's complete bollocks. I mean, we saw in the budget yesterday that the, 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 the politicians have voted themselves $14 million for increased protection for themselves. Yeah, you because know, it's terrible. People are saying hurty things, and they might, they might, they might act on it. Well, in my experience in New Zealand, people don't act on very much at all. Just look at the, the vaccine mandates and everything. Nobody said, no, you know what? That, that's against the um, Bill of Rights. How many people said that? You know, I, I can name them. Just that's yeah. how few there were that were saying that. And everyone else just went along with it to get along. And then Kiwis are their own worst enemy, and especially the firearms community. Though people will get along, will, will will get along to to get along, you know. They, they'll comply with things because they think if I don't comply, well, then it'll go badly for me. And we've got people in our club at Antique Arms that think that the police walk on water and that oh no, it's only reasonable. And this is the problem that the arms community has had. You've got organisations like Colfo um, and some other people um, like Pistol New Zealand, and they act. Pistol New Zealand's perhaps the worst offender. They only care about what affects them. So when all of these bans on firearms and things came in, the Pistol New Zealand said, oh, no, we agree with that because that doesn't affect us in our pistol shooting. And I said to them at the time, and I said to Colfo, you've got to stop complying. It's just like the pandemic. You can't comply yourself out of tyranny. And it becomes a slippery slope. And you agree, okay, we'll agree to that. And then next week they're coming at you with another regulation and they'll and they'll go and they'll say, oh well, you need to be reasonable about this. And then being reasonable with the police invites them to squeeze you a little bit more. And then you you, you they say, Oh no, come on, be reasonable. And they squeeze you a little bit more. And they squeeze you a little bit more. And now, of course, the pistol pistol New Zealand is squawking because the new rules and regulations around ranges and those sorts of things are now hurting them. Mm. The, 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 the new transportation laws are now hurting them because the armour has got all these guns in his car and he has to secure them all somehow, you know. Um, it, but they, they caused that because of their soft compliance on issues that didn't matter to them. But now they're getting squeezed. They're expecting everybody else to go to come to their aid. Well, Sorry, you didn't stand up. You didn't stand up for collectors. You didn't stand up for, um, you know, uh, uh, free gun shooters. You didn't stand up for these these people. And now you want to stand up because it's hurting you because you've been squeezed. But sorry, you know, my my um, understanding and caring about your problem ceased to exist a long time ago. Well, for me, all of this always circles back to free speech. 
always. Absolutely. Because we've been groomed into complacency. We've been groomed into complacency that if you do not push back on this, your comfort, your level of comfort will be maintained. If you do push back on this, because we do not live in an environment where free speech is cherished, you then get cancelled or called out either amongst your peers or in the media or by people in authority or in the public service. And most people do not have thick skins. They're not disagreeable. That's, I mean, New Zealanders are nice people. They're agreeable people. And we actually, in a way, I think, need to go back a bit to our mongrel roots and find a little bit of disagreeableness to actually go back and put our hands up and say, actually, no. And I think that momentum is starting, but it's not, I think, anywhere near fast enough. And it's certainly not reaching, reaching the echelons of our political classes, that's for sure. Well, you can't put the genie back in the bottle too. So, mm. you know, the pandemic allowed, I call them the regime, you know, because that's how they were acting, high-handed and extrajudicially. Uh they created a situation where people accepted excesses and breaches of the Bill of Rights. Now, no one in the United States accepts breaches of the Bill of Rights. They sue straight away or they fight. Uh, New Zealanders have lost the fight. You know, we, we used to be such a capable nation. Now we get a weather forecast that says there's going to be a bit of rain and You've got this grief porn and weather porn being pushed on all the media and how it's terrible. We're going to have floods. People are going to die. We all need to stay at home. And it just turns into can't. We've just become feeble and weak and pathetic. You know, in, in 1944, 18-year-olds were charging off um, landing craft into you know, German machine guns and artillery and, and bombings. Uh, across the beaches of Normandy. And now 18-year-olds can't work out whether they're Arthur or Martha and need safe spaces. You know, we've actually created a society where people like Charles Upham are not revered anymore, they're despised. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Barry Crumps of this world would never get anywhere because he's so politically incorrect. Right? Mm. But that is the ethos that we've come from and somehow... We've allowed society to de degrade to such an extent that we've become weak and pathetic and, and victims. And the politicians, if you give them an inch, they'll take 100 miles. And they saw that with a little bit of frowny faces, some clever messaging, that they could do awful things to society and we'd suck it up. Mm. Well, it's a, it, that's the cultural shift in terms of demonising what that what Robin D'Angelo likes to call toxic masculinity. I mean, masculinity isn't toxic, it's masculinity that's gotten us to where we are. And that that's is, right. it, yeah. and you just look at the leadership today. I mean, gosh, I so wish that Christopher, either Christopher would find a little bit of disagreeable toxicity. That would be a, a damn sight better than the sort of simpering. I don't, I don't know about you. Have you ever met a Christopher that's strong? The name's weak anyway, isn't it? You know, I think it just breeds it. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson touches on that, you know, that he doesn't call it the toxic ma masculinity. Um, he talks about dangerous men doing dangerous things, you know. Uh, and, and he says that a dangerous man is a good man, someone who has the ability to be dangerous to other people, use extreme violence, but chooses not to is a strong man. And we've emasculated society where strength is not a desirable trait that we see in our politicians. And instead we've got wet, woke and weak people who are trying to lead us. We've we've lacked that ability, that menace that exists amongst strong men who are disciplined that if you cross this line then it's going to hurt has been bred out of society you know by by the weak and the feeble the ones who are tough behind their keyboard and their screen but you confront them in person and they're pathetic weak human beings and we're seeing this in society in many many different things you know in relationships where you know the soy boy type 
um, in touch with their feelings, you know, soft bloke is held up as the sort of guy that women uh, are seeking when the reality is, is women like strong men and they like to be protected and they like to feel safe. And no, you know, stringy vegan, um, you know, soy boy type pansy bloke is going to be able to protect somebody when things get tough. No, no, not at all. Have you caught up with any of the shenanigans that's going on in the Deep South at the moment? No, which shenanigans are those? So in the Deep South, there's obviously the stuff that's going on in Gore, but a little further south in Southland, they have a the public swimming pool there called Splash Planet. There has been a group of locals that called a meeting with, I think, the chief operating officer and the head of the pool around concerns when they realised that the pool were going to now enforce rules that biological males could enter into female changing rooms. So they just needed to identify as female to be there. And the locals uh, came across this and were quite concerned. And so they called this meeting. Those at the meeting only expected to have four or five people turn up. Uh, meanwhile, several, several hundred turned up. Now, I've heard 45 minutes uh, audio of that meeting. And what I heard in there were a lot of very angry fathers. And it actually gave me some hope that there are some men and with these families and these fathers, these parents out there who are now starting to push back. And like we're all so busy, as you said, there's that complacency. And a lot of parents, we've actually usurped a lot of that parenting back to the state, to the schools. You send the kids off to school, get them back at three o'clock and you assume that they have been taken care of, whereas now there is actually a level of indoctrination that's going on at schools that most parents are only just discovering. So this meeting is, it's still evolving down there, but they were going to take it to council. Nobby Clark, there's a name for a mayor for you, <laughs> Nobby Clark, he has said that they're not going to bring it to in front of council, this issue, and what they're hoping to do is to say that the family units or unisex changing rooms or toilets can be used as a compromise for people who are biologically one way but identify as another. So they're trying to put a band-aid over it. For me, the hope was is seeing a combined anger from a community actually standing up and saying, no, we're not comfortable with this now, but we need more of that across many issues, not just this one. Well, it comes down to terminology, really. and The manipulation the, of language, yeah. Correct. So you'll always hear corporates, especially corporate, uh, woke corporates, uh, you'll hear um, politicians, and they talk about um, protecting the trans community, right? So... That's presuming that there is, in fact, a community of such people, right? It's a lie. There is no community. Yeah. Now, I happen to know a couple of trans people, and they've been trans people before it was a thing, right? So they're brave people. They've decided to live like that, and that's all good. One's a you know, property investor. and But anyway... They tell, tell me there's no such thing as a trans community. It's not a community. They don't all live together. They don't all um, socialise together. They're just ordinary people just getting on with their lives, and that's how they want to live. But there's this agenda, this woke culture agenda that has seeped into society uh, through woke corporates. And, you know, I'll probably get attacked for this, but... Um, my experience is that if there are key women in key positions in organisations, particularly in human resources, particularly in senior management, then that company starts to degrade uh, because they start embracing this kindness and woke and they forget about profit and, and looking after their customers. And then they start pushing these agendas to be inclusive, which is ironic because it's actually exclusive. It's like the meme the other day about rugby uh, in Australia have decided to embrace 
you know, the voice there and that it's all about inclusiveness and all of this. And somebody posted a picture of Israel Folau and said, what about including him? <laughs> right? So all of this inclusiveness that they talk about is actually exclusiveness. It's, it's it, if you don't fit in with this, then you shall be excluded. Mm. It, it, it's a lie. And the, 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 it's a fantasy that there's a community. And it's also, a, if you just look at the math, right, Around about 5% of the population, give or take a couple of percent, hmm. uh, and, and not heterosexual. That's the easiest way to say that, right? So they're not heterosexual. They're something else. And trans people are a tiny percentage of that 5%, and we're talking hundreds of people, certainly not thousands of people, and we've got this massive vocal violent push to promote their wacky ideology onto the vast majority of people and there's going to be pushback and it's it's starting and and Mm. it's not going to be pleasant and then they'll shriek a lot whole lot more and there'll be handbags at dawn um but this is the fantasy of all of this you know um creation of separate little communities that actually don't exist. Well, it's the devolution uh, of individualism because they don't well, want to right. create strong individuals. They want to pop everybody into their little box and woe betide if you're a Rachel Stewart of the world and yeah. you get out of, you know, we've popped you in the rainbow box, darling, with the with the ever-growing alphabet. That's the box that we've put you in. And she's like, no, I'm just who I am. I just happen to prefer... One of my gay friends calls it 95% of the world are heterosexual. The rest of us are interesting. <laughs> so, but, but, you know, that's the thing. Like, they, they want us to care about who they are, but they don't care about who we are. You know, and this whole thing about pronouns is a classic example, right? That is control of language. What these people are saying to us is that they want to control how we speak about them in the third person when they're not there, right? Because when we're speaking to them to the face-to-face, it's like, oh, okay, Marie, right? Or, or if you're only using pronouns when you're talking about someone in the third person, or he said that, or they did that, or, or whatever. And they're trying to control the language about how we speak about someone when they're not there. Hmm. It's bizarre. I mean, I'm sorry, a plural it's cannot not. be a pronoun. No. Yeah, if you want to, you know, what if I decided I want to call myself killer whale instead of can? You know, that's the pronoun. I, it's just, but actually, here's a better one. What, what if my pronoun's handsome? Now, I'm not handsome, right? But, but I now insist that everybody describes me as handsome because that's my pronoun. That's the ludicrousness of it all. Right, then they're trying to control the language about how everybody else speaks, and Maori are doing this too with the insidious creep of, you know, pigeon Maori into into our language on television and radio, where you get a situation where inf- the whole idea about language is that information is imparted, and they're making it exclusive, so you don't actually know what the hell anyone's talking about anymore. So I not, uh, spoke to uh, Dailandi uh, last week, and she is uh, one of the founders of a group called Mana Wahini Kōrero, and she mm. was talking about exactly that. I mean, it's not only the English language that has been captured and bastardised, it is also the Māori language. As she said, English alliterations that have been turned into to Māori, and she said, no, uh, she said none of the nannies on the Marae understand this. They're just like, what is this? You know, this this isn't this isn't our language. Now, those who are at university, those all those academics that you know have laundered themselves with multiple papers that claim that they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. You they mean the are... colonial invention called universities? <laughs> you mean that? Yeah, that. <laughs> they will argue that no, the language is a living thing and it needs to evolve. Ultimately, language is there to communicate. And if you are actually going to devolve a language to a point where the native speakers of that language can't even understand it themselves because these words were invented yesterday, well, then that's not inclusive, is it? Well, what cracks me up is this massive insistence that we all use macrons 
right, for, for how we spell things now. Well, you know, at the same time, the people who are insisting that we do that are railing against colonialism. Well, how colonial is it to use a Greek creation from several thousand years ago to describe how we speak Maori in modern society? Is that not colonialist to use uh, European language constructs to describe Maori now? Yeah, this, this is the nonsensical logic that these people are employing. You know, the, the same person who is complaining about cultural appropriation of Maori uh, you know, by movie the, movie um, studios and, and songs and, and designs is, is a guy wearing a cowboy hat, <laughs> you know, in a bolo tie. Like, who, what about your cultural appropriation? Yeah. You look back in the years, you know, with Monty Python, you know, 40 years ago was in the life of Brian, they were talking about, you know. Loretta. Um, Loretta, you know. <laughs> you know, oh, no, I want to be called Loretta now. Why? Well, why can't I? You know, it was it was ludicrous then and it's ludicrous now. And then the same thing goes on this colonialism thing. They made the famous skit where they said, well, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, there's the aqueducts. Well, okay, apart from the aqueducts, what have the Romans ever done for us? What is the roads? Well, okay, well, it's the same thing, this colonialism argument is what have the British ever done for us? Well, there's the laws, the hospitals, the society, the, the, you know, all of these sorts of things. They want to use all of those things, but they want to rail against colonialism. It, it's, it doesn't make sense. It's nuts. And the more we tolerate it, the more we accept it, the more farcical it becomes. It certainly does. And I think, I mean, we could talk about this all morning, but we're not going to. I will pick it up on another day. Like, Cam, I'm absolutely thrilled that you've been able to give us some time this morning. Thank you very, very much. If you've got questions out there for us or me at Counterculture, the address to write your email to is inbox at realitycheck.radio that's inbox at realitycheck.radio or send us a text 2057 is the number stay tuned more to come here with reality check and counterculture this is counterculture with marie busky wednesdays at 10 a.m on reality check radio